Hello everyone, welcome to PW Gulf. So today we are going to do the ultimate recap session for the chapter Kinetic Theory of Gases and Thermodynamics. In today's lecture, we will be covering what is internal e energy, heat, work, zeroth law of thermodynamics, first law of thermodynamics. Then we will doing various thermodynamic processes, isobaric, isochoric, isothermal, adiabatic, all those processes. Then we'll be going on to heat engine, second law of thermodynamics, Carnot engine, their efficiency, refrigerator or heat pump, all those. And then we will go to kinetic theory of gases, ideal gases, what is the pressure exerted, what is the mean free path and all that stuff. Okay. So without wasting any time, let's start our first topic, which says thermodynamic equilibrium. Now see. A system is said to be in thermodynamic equilibrium if the macroscopic variables which are describing the system do not change with the time, okay? So if we have a system, okay, if we have a system, thermodynamic equilibrium will be established when any variable, any macroscopic variable is not changing with time. So if we have thermodynamic equilibrium, there should be first thermal equilibrium, there should be thermal equilibrium and there should be second, there should be mechanical equilibrium as well. Mechanical equilibrium and there should be chemical equilibrium. So if all three equilibria exist, okay, all three mechanical, thermal and chemical equilibrium are existing, then we will say the system is in thermal equilibrium. So let us take if this is system A, this is B and this is C, okay, they are separated by conducting walls, they are separated by conducting walls, then after some time what will happen, after some time what will happen, the temperature of A, B and C will become equal, hence they will be said to be in thermal equilibrium, okay, they will be said to be in thermal equilibrium. Temperature only decides thermal. When we have thermodynamic, there should be thermal, mechanical as well as chemical equilibrium. Okay, the, all the three temperatures will become equal. Ta will be equal to Tb, it will be equal to Tc. So this is the condition for thermal equilibrium. There is a difference between thermal and thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so let us see further zeroth law of thermodynamics. Now, zeroth law of thermodynamics states that if two systems are in thermal equilibrium with the third system separately, okay. So, let us take this example that this is an insulated system which is insulated from surroundings. In this, we have three systems. One is A. We have three systems A, B and C. Now A and B, C or B and C are separated by a adiabatic wall. Okay. B and C are separated by a adiabatic wall that is non-conducting wall or insulating wall and this is also insulated from surroundings. Insulated from surroundings now the wall between a b and a and b and a and c this is conducting wall okay this is a conducting wall so what will happen after some time a can exchange heat energy with b and a can exchange heat energy with c okay so after some time a and b will come in equilibrium a and c will come in equilibrium so what will happen? B and C will also be in equilibrium. Okay. So if A and C are in thermal equilibrium and also A and B are in thermal equilibrium. So according to zeroth law, what we will have is B and C are also, this implies that B and C will also be in thermal equilibrium. Now when we have equilibrium, 
one quantity will become unchanging with time it will become constant with time okay it will not change which quantity so zeroth law gave rise to temperature okay so there is a quantity which will not change with temperature or time and that quantity was termed as temperature okay it gave rise to temperature from zeroth law we get the idea of temperature that thermodynamic quantity which is not changing with time is called temperature so ta and tc will be equal because they are exchanging heat with each other so their temperature will become equal and also ta will be equal to tb because a and b can also exchange heat they have a conducting wall between them if temperature of a is equal to temperature of c and temperature of a is also equal to temperature of b then what implies that temperature of b will be equal to temperature of c hence b and c are also in thermal equilibrium so this is the zeroth law of thermodynamics now what is internal energy the energy which is possessed by the gas due to its own state okay due to its own state so gas molecules are continuous in uh, continuously moving they are in random motion they will have kinetic energy plus there will be some attractive forces or between them so they will have some potential energy if we consider ideal gases we say that there is only and only kinetic energy no force of attraction is present between the molecules so there is no potential energy okay so internal energy is simply the sum of kinetic and potential energies of the molecules in which frame we take it is in the frame with according to which center of mass is at rest okay so if we observe in the frame of reference of center of mass then the sum of kinetic plus potential energies will give us the internal energy okay so basically internal energy is its own energy internal energy is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy for ideal gases for ideal gases internal energy it is denoted by u okay internal energy u this will be equal to kinetic energy only okay because they don't possess any potential energy now internal energy is a state function what do we mean by state function internal energy doesn't depend on the path by which the state is achieved okay it only depends on the present state if system is in this state it will have this much energy it doesn't matter how this particular state was achieved so it doesn't depend on the history of the gas it only depends on the current state of the gas if the gas is having this much pressure volume temperature then this much must be its internal energy okay so it it only depends on the state of the gas not how the state was achieved so internal energy is a state variable okay internal energy is a state variable or we can say state function it is not a path variable or path function okay so if we go from a to b if we go from if we have a gas at state a and then we take it to another state b by any process okay by any process delta u change in internal energy will be same in all processes okay it is same in all processes okay now next is heat and work let us see what is heat and work heat and work are two distinct modes of energy transfer okay heat and work are both they both are the mode of transfer of energy to a system okay that will result in a change in its internal energy if energy is transferred or taken out from a system okay released by a system or transferred to a system then what will happen its internal energy will change okay so heat and work are two distinct modes by which we can transfer energy to a system so see heat is the energy transfer due to temperature difference okay when there is a temperature difference between the system and surroundings then there is a transfer of energy between them and due to that temperature difference whatever energy is being transferred that is called heat energy now work is energy transfer brought about by means 
of any physical work that is not involving temperature difference okay so if we are if we have a piston attached to some weight and we are lowering the weight piston comes up if we are pushing the weight up piston will come down now gas is ga energy is being supplied to the gas or energy is being released from the gas so work is energy transfer brought by brought about by means that do not involve temperature change okay by any other means if we are pushing the piston if we are push, uh, pulling the piston any other means okay increasing the volume decreasing the volume all that mean uh, all the energy transfer due to that is called a uh, work okay that is called work which do not involve which do not involve temperature difference now the most important line heat and work are path variables okay if we go from one state of a gas to another state of a gas there will be a change there will be a change uh, some heat will be released or some heat will be absorbed some work will be done on the gas or some work will be done by the gas both can happen okay so what happens the, these are dependent on path okay whatever path we have taken if we go from one state to another along one path and then along second path there will be work done and heat will be different along different paths they depend on the path variable the path taken by the system to change its state they are not state variables okay now what sign conventions we will follow in this chapter is heat supplied to the system is taken as positive heat released by the system is taken as negative okay if heat is released by the system it will be negative if heat is if heat is supplied to the system it is positive okay work done by the system is positive if gas is doing some work work is being done by the system it is positive and is work is being done on the system we are doing some work on the system it will be negative these are the sign conventions we have to follow what are indicator diagrams if we take any two variables okay if we take any two thermodynamic variables and draw a graph between those two thermodynamic variables as the state of the system is changing okay so a graphical representation of the state of the system what is graphical representation of state of system with the help of two thermodynamic variables with the help of two thermodynamic variables is called an indicator diagram so it could be between p and v t and v p and t any two variables we can take if we take between p and v so what we are seeing is as the pressure see here as the pressure is being lowered there is a increase in the volume of the gas okay so volume of gas increases from v1 to v2 as pressure changes from p1 to p2 okay pressure decreases so this initially the system was at this state p1 v1 and the system goes to this state p2 v2 now we have to show this arrow that system is moving like this it is compressing or it is expanding okay we have to show how system is changing its state from 1 to 2 okay so if this is called this is a pv diagram okay this is called a pv diagram a diagram between pressure and volume this will be a pv diagram so from here we can see that as the pressure is lowering the volume is changing okay this is called an indicator diagram now let us do work done during expansion of a gas okay so what is the work done during expansion of the gas we know that work done during expansion work done during expansion so if gas volume is changing by a small amount dv then work done will be p dv so from here we can get the total work done this will be integration of p dv from v1 to v2 okay this gives us the work done by the gas during expansion okay this gives us the work done by the gas during expansion next thing is if we have a indicator diagram okay if we have a pv diagram okay if we have a pv diagram now see this area under the curve
this area under the curve, if we see area under PV diagram, area under PV curve. Now what is the area under PV curve? Area we know that it will be integration of P dV from V1 to V2. Isn't this the work done? Isn't this the work done? If we want to find this area under the curve, so it will be integration of P dV from V1 to V2. So from here we get that area under PV curve, area under PV diagram gives the uh, work done. Okay, This gives the uh, work done. Now see how can we judge that work done will be positive or negative. If volume is increasing, work done will be positive. If volume is decreasing, work done will be negative. Okay, so you have to see system. Area will give us only the magnitude. Okay, if we want to find area, it will only give us the magnitude of work done. We have to judge that it is a positive work done or it is a negative work done. If the gas is moving like this, okay, if gas is moving like this from 1 to 2, volume is increasing so area will be we will take that area as positive work done as positive if we are moving from 2 to 1 there is a compression volume is decreasing we will take that area as negative okay so this will be the work done let us see next what a cyclic and non cyclic process the one in which the system doesn't doesn't return to its initial state is a non cyclic process so if we see like this, we have a PV diagram like this. This will be a non-cyclic process. System goes from 1 to 2 and never comes back. So this will be a non-cyclic process. Any process in which the system comes back to its initial state after undergoing a number of changes. Okay, If system goes from 1 to 2 and then comes back Okay, and then comes back from 2 to 1 okay if system uh, goes comes back to its initial state after undergoing numerous amount of changes then it is called a cyclic process okay so this one is a non cyclic and this one will be a cyclic process okay that is a non cyclic process and this is a cyclic process now let us see work done in a cyclic process so total work done if we say in this process we did w1 work and this process we did w2 work okay so from here work done total work done will be w1 plus w2 now w1 will be let us draw it downwards. Okay. A, B, let us name it as C, T. Okay. So, what is W? W1 area is increasing as we go from A. So, it will be area under the curve. W1 will be area under the curve A, X, B. This work done in this process A to B. It will be A, X, B, all the area under A, X, B. So A, X, B, C, D, A, this one will be the work done and if we do the W2, it will be area under this curve, A, Y, B, C, D, A. Now see, in this volume was increasing, work done is positive. In this volume is decreasing, work done will be negative. So what, we, what will be the area? Area will be B, Y, A, D, C, B. Okay, this will be the area. Now if from this area we subtract this much area what we will get we will get the area of loop okay area a x b y a a x b y a this is the area so work done in a cyclic process work done in a cyclic process is equal to area of loop okay this will be equal to area of loop work done in a cyclic process is equal to area of loop 
now let us see when it will be positive when it will be negative now see if the loop is clockwise okay if the loop is clockwise area in expansion is more than area in compression so net work done will be positive okay so for clockwise loop if the loop is clockwise work done in expansion is more than work done in compression so total work done will be positive okay total work done will be positive if we have anti clockwise loop if we have anti clockwise loop like this if we have anti clockwise compression is more so work done in compression is more than work done in expansion now we know that these are negative so we are talking about their mod okay compression's work is negative so we are taking about the numeric value okay only so total work done will be negative okay total work done will be negative this we have to remember now what is first law of thermodynamics first law of thermodynamics see according to first law of thermodynamics if delta q amount of energy is supplied to the system some amount of this energy will increase the internal energy of the system will go into changing the internal energy and some amount of this energy will do some uh, work it will be used by the system in doing some work so what we have is according to first law of thermodynamics energy delta q supplied to the system goes partly to increase the internal energy delta u rest will be done in a uh, work okay rest is done in work so from this we get that delta q is equal to delta u plus delta w okay from this we get the equation the delta q is equal to delta u plus delta w now if we have small change we can write it like this delta q or sometimes it is also written as a dq we can write dq also but more appropriate will be if we write like this okay the same can be written like this okay this is the first law of thermodynamics it is based on conservation of energy if some energy is given partly will increase the internal and the rest will do some work okay it is based on conservation of energy now see specific heat of a gas now when gas is being heated what happens its volume and pressure changes okay so when gas is heated volume and pressure change with the increase in temperature so there is not always a fixed amount of there is not like just like solids we have fixed amount so in gases we don't have a fixed amount of heat that will be required to raise the temperature of one mole of a gas by 1 degree celsius it depends on the pressure and volume conditions of the gas okay so here the gases don't possess a single specific heat okay gases do not possess a single specific heat because it depends specific heat of gases depends on the physical conditions on the state of gas better if we choose word like this it depends on the state of gas that is its pressure and volume okay basically pressure and volume of the gas so there is not always a fixed energy sometimes volume might start increasing so there will be increase in temperature due to the Uh, uh, heat absorbed plus due to expansion there will be a fall in temperature as well okay so gases can possess a positive negative it can have a zero and it can have infinite heat also specific heat capacity okay so they don't have a fixed value these are range of values for gas but we study two principal specific heats okay we study two principal specific heats let us study molar specific heat at constant volume okay so it is defined as amount of heat required to raise the temperature of 1 mole of gas by 1 degree celsius at constant volume okay so what amount of heat we will be requiring okay so cv it is denoted by cv it will be amount of heat required to raise the temperature by 1 degree celsius of 1 mole of gas 
at constant volume okay at constant volume so this will be the specific heat at constant volume delta q uh, heat required per unit change in the temperature per unit mole of the gas at constant volume so if we want to find delta q what heat must be supplied to the system at constant volume to change its temperature by delta t then it will be equal to n cv delta t okay heat supplied at constant volume will be equal to n cv delta t now uh, by first law of thermodynamics by first so first law of thermodynamics or uh, what we will have we have delta q is equal to delta u plus delta w now we know that delta w it is equal to pdv so we can write it as delta u plus or better if we write like this delta q is equal to du plus dw so from here we get delta q is equal to du plus work done small work done is pdv now volume is constant okay a volume is constant so dv will be zero dv is zero so from here we will get delta w this will be zero there will be no work done so heat supplied at constant volume what it is it is ncv dt or ncv delta t if the change in temperature is very small we can write it as ncv dt and dq as ncv dt so this will be equal to du from this we get a very important relation that du is equal to ncv dt du is only temperature dependent okay internal energy is only a function of temperature it is only temperature dependent if ten temperature changes by du uh, dt amount then change in internal energy du will be ncv dt now because u is a state variable okay because u is a state variable so you go by any process this is valid okay this is valid for all processes this is valid for all processes this is valid for all processes you go by any of the process any of the process okay du will be ncv dt only u is a only a function of temperature now let us find molar specific heat at constant volume so if we want to raise the temperature of one mole of gas by 1 degree celsius at constant pressure then it will be called as molar specific heat at constant pressure denoted by cp it will be 1 by n delta q by delta t at constant pressure so this will be the value of cp and if we want to find how much heat we should supply at constant pressure it will be equal to ncp delta t okay heat supplied at constant pressure will be ncp delta t now see if we apply first law of thermodynamics what will happen delta q is equal to delta u plus delta w now in this case delta w is not zero so delta q at at constant pressure at constant pressure delta w is not equal to zero so some heat will go into work done also and some heat will raise the temperature so to raise the temperature by the same amount at constant pressure we have to supply some more heat because du will be always ncv dt okay we have to supply some more amount of heat okay du will be always ncv dt okay now see at constant pressure we will have some work done also so we have to supply extra heat to do some work plus raise the temperature so if we say delta q at constant pressure is greater than delta q at constant volume so from here we get that cp will be greater than cv okay so cp is greater than cv because at constant pressure some of the heat goes into work done also okay now there is a very important relation between the two okay and that relation is given as 
सी पी माइनस सी वी इज इक्वल टू आर ओके दिस इज कॉल्ड मेयर्स रिलेशन वेरी 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 इंपॉर्टेंट यू शुड रिमेंबर दिस दिस इज कॉल्ड मेयर्स रिलेशन सी पी माइनस सी वी इज इक्वल टू आर वॉट इज द रिलेशन बिटवीन द टू स्पेसिफिक हीट सी पी माइनस सी वी इज इक्वल टू आर दिस इज द रिलेशन बिटवीन द टू स्पेसिफिक हीट्स ओके now let us move to thermodynamic processes now there are various thermodynamic processes we will be studying isothermal isothermal means constant temperature okay isotherm so any process which occurs at constant temperature is called a isothermal process isobaric iso means constant and bar for pressure so with the process which will occur at constant pressure is called isobaric then isochoric iso same constant choric is for volume so the process which occurs at constant volume is called isochoric and adiabatic process it is a thermodynamic process in which there is a no exchange of heat between the system and surroundings okay there is no exchange of heat between the system and surroundings that is called a adiabatic process okay so for if temperature is constant delta t will be zero if pressure is constant delta p is zero if volume is constant delta v will be zero and if adiabatic process delta q will be zero okay these are the various thermodynamic processes let us study them one by one what is an isothermal process in which the temperature remains constant and pressure and volume of the gas change now what is the equation of an isothermal process equation of an isothermal process is pv will be equal to constant okay this is the equation for an isothermal process that pv will be a constant okay pv will be a constant this is the equation for an isothermal process so from here we can say that if temperature is constant okay pv will be remaining a constant draw the graph between p and v if we draw the indicator diagram between p and v how it will look like it will be a hyperbolic curve like this okay it will be a hyperbolic curve now here system will remain in thermal equilibrium because temperature is constant so heat will be exchanged we need perfectly conducting wall and we should give enough time to exchange the heat so isothermal processes are slow processes okay slow processes so the system should get time to exchange heat with the surroundings okay process should be a slow process now apply first law of thermodynamics we have dq is equal to du plus dw if i write perfect differentials although we cannot write so because these are path variables okay we cannot write them like this now see du is dt temperature is a constant so dt will be zero okay dt will be zero p delta v okay delta q is equal to delta q is equal to du plus p delta v so dt is zero this symbolizes du which is equal to n cv dt this will be zero okay so for isothermal process change in internal energy is zero okay change in internal energy of the gas will be zero so if change in internal energy of the gas is zero what we will have by first law all the heat supplied will go into work done okay all the heat supplied will go into work done delta q is equal to p delta v all the heat supplied will go into work done if heat is supplied q will be positive delta v is positive volume increases okay if heat is supplied to the system volume will increase if heat is as extracted from the system it is released by the system delta v will be negative okay so this is isothermal process work done in an isothermal 
process. So what is work done in an isothermal process? Work done in isothermal process is equal to, we have 2.303 nRT log to the base 10 V2 by V1. Okay. Or we can write it like this. NRT ln of V2 by V1. Okay. This is the work done by an isothermal process. If we want to write in form of pressure, it will be NRT ln of P1 by P2. Okay. This is the work done in an isothermal process. Now let us move forward to adiabatic process in which there is no exchange of heat. So delta Q is 0. Now by first law of thermodynamics what we have delta Q is equal to delta U plus delta W or delta Q is equal to delta U plus P delta V. So from here delta Q is 0 we get that delta U plus P delta V will be 0 for an adiabatic process that is delta U is equal to minus of P delta V okay so whatever work is being done that is being done at the expense of internal energy okay whatever work is being done if delta V is positive gas is expanding work is done by the system so delta U will be a negative delta U is negative internal energy is decreasing okay gas expands gas if gas expands P delta V work done will be delta W is equal to P delta V this will be positive so from here the delta U will be negative okay internal energy will decrease okay if gas compresses okay if gas is compressed what we will have delta W P delta V this will be negative so delta U is positive okay so if work is done by the system that is being done at the expense of internal energy internal energy is used to do that work and if work is done on the system that work will be goes with that work will go into increasing the internal energy of the system okay its temperature will increase if delta u decreases temperature decreases okay this will happen so from here delta u decreases that is temperature decreases and delta u increases that is temperature increases okay so this is adiabatic process now what is the work done in an adiabatic process let us write equation of an adiabatic process so equation of an adiabatic process is p v gamma is equal to constant okay p into v raised to the power gamma is constant gamma is called adiabatic constant gamma is called adiabatic constant now gamma is the ratio of cp by cv okay gamma is the ratio of cp by cv okay now we know that p is equal to p is uh, p is equal to pv is equal to nrt for an ideal gas so from here we came in we get one more equation if we substitute P as nRT by V, so we will get T into V raised to the power gamma minus 1 is a constant. This is the another equation. Also, if we substitute, if we want to find the equation between P and T, so we substitute it as C, P and T. So keep P volume can be written as nRT by uh, v uh, sorry nrt by p raised to the power gamma so we will get p as p into 1 raised to the power min uh, p raised to the power 1 minus gamma into t raised to the power gamma this will be a constant okay so these are the equation of an adiabatic process these are the equations of an adiabatic process now let us find work done in an adiabatic process.
Now work done in an adiabatic process. So for work done adiabatic process W is equal to NR divided by 1 minus gamma into T2 minus T1 if temperature goes from T1 to T2 and also we can write it as 1 by 1 minus gamma P2 V2 minus P1 V1 okay this is the work done in an adiabatic process okay this is the work done in an adiabatic process nr divided by 1 minus gamma into t2 minus t1 because in an adiabatic process pressure volume temperature all the three thermodynamic variables will change okay this is the work done in an adiabatic process what is an isochoric process in an isochoric process volume is a constant okay so if volume is constant delta v is zero which implies work done what is work done so work done is p delta v this will be a zero okay so work done in an isochoric process will be zero work done in an isochoric process will be zero okay so from here by first law of thermodynamics we get delta q is equal to delta u okay so whatever heat is supplied to the system it will increase in internal energy if heat is released by the system or extracted from the system it will decrease its internal energy okay so this is isochoric process let us go to isobaric process in an isobaric process what remains constant uh, pressure remains constant okay pressure remains constant so what we have here we have delta q is equal to delta u plus p delta v okay so there is nothing not delta u is zero not p work done is not zero okay so pressure is constant if we want to find work done in an isobaric process work done in an isobaric process so this will be w integration of p dv from v1 to v2 so p is a constant it will come out so work done is simply p into v2 minus v1 okay work done is simply p into v2 minus v1 okay this is the work done in an isobaric process now let us go to heat engine what is a heat engine it is a device okay which absorbs some amount of heat so let us draw a heat engine now heat engine has three components one is a source other one is a sink okay now source is at temperature t1 sink is at temperature t2 such that t1 is greater than t2 okay now here we have a working substance working substance could be anything a fuel or a gas anything so we have a working substance what heat engine does is heat engine takes some heat from the source okay it will take some heat from the source absorb some q1 heat or from the source and it will do some work okay it will use a cyclic process to do some mechanical work okay it will use some cyclic process to do some mechanical work and reject rest of the heat to a sink okay and rejects rest of the heat to the sink so q1 is heat absorbed q2 is heat rejected and w is the work done by the working substance okay so how we define efficiency efficiency of any heat engine efficiency of heat engine how we will define its efficiency see efficiency is output by input so we have what we want is work done what we give is heat absorbed so efficiency is work done by heat absorbed now apply from here we get that q1 amount of heat is absorbed some of it is used in work done and the rest is rejected okay so q1 will be equal to w plus q2 so from here work done will be 
q1 minus q2 okay from here work done will be q1 minus q2 this is the work done so from here we get that eta okay efficiency is equal to q1 minus q2 divided by q1 which is also equal to 1 minus q2 by q1 okay this is the efficiency of heat engine okay so heat engine is basically a device which continuously converts heat into mechanical work using a cyclic process now why we use a cyclic process because in cyclic process we came back to its initial state and u being a state function the change in internal energy of the gas becomes zero whatever heat comes it will be converted into work okay now C next is second law of thermodynamics. So there are two statements for second law of thermodynamics. One is given by Calvin and Planck, other is given by Clausius. Now Calvin and Planck says that uh, they state it is impossible to construct an engine which will produce no effect other than extracting heat from a reservoir and performing equivalent amount of work okay they are saying that there is no engine possible that it will what it will do it will only do two processes okay it will not do any other thing then extracting heat from a source and converting all the heat into work that is q2 will be zero okay that is q2 is never equal to zero some heat will be rejected there is not any engine any engine is not possible which is rejecting zero heat to the sink okay so it is impossible to construct an engine which will produce no effect other than extracting heat from a reservoir and performing equivalent amount of work whatever heat is being absorbed it is converted into work this is not possible okay and clausius states that there is impossible for a self acting machine what is self acting machine that is it is not driven by any external source we are not providing any external energy to the system it is impossible for a self acting machine unaided by any external agency they have written in the next line also to transfer heat from a body to another body at higher temperature that a system by own that a system by own cannot transfer for heat from a body at lower temperature to a body at higher temperature okay heat by own always flow from body at higher temperature to body at lower temperature we can only extract some heat from the body at lower temperature if we are using some external agency to do some work okay we cannot a body by itself cannot extract heat from a any a self acting machine which is not driven by any external source it cannot extract heat from a body at lower temperature and transfer it to body at higher temperature okay this is the second law of thermodynamics now let us do what are reversible and irreversible process see any process is reversible if it can be turned back such that both the system and the surroundings return to their original states any process which can be turned back to its original state such that the system not only the system whole of the system and the surroundings turn back to the same original state okay turn back to the same original state without any other change in the universe there should be no change in the universe whatever the situation of universe was in the starting that should be at the afterwards after the reversible process also okay so process is reversible only if it is quasi static quasi static such a so slow process that the system is always in equilibrium with the surroundings at all the states okay at all the states at every stage and there are no dissipative effects if there are dissipative forces involved what will happen some of the energy is lost and when we come back we cannot extract that energy back into the system so we cannot reverse it cannot be a reversible process okay any process which can't be reversed will be an irreversible process okay now see carnot engine carnot engine was created by sadi carnot it is a engine which will have a maximum efficiency between the two temperature limits t1 and t2 okay now sadi carnot was 
raise the question that what maximum efficiency can be constructed okay what how which engine can be constructed which will have a maximum efficiency for maximum efficiency we need a reversible processes okay because if there are irreversible processes some energy is lost efficiency is not maximum so what sadi carnot found out that to have a engine of maximum efficiency we need a cyclic process okay so what is reversible process okay we need a reversible process now which processes should be a part of that reversible cyclic process so sadi carnot said that first process he determined was a adia isothermal expansion okay first process which he determined was an isothermal expansion that system will go from p1 v1 t1 to p2 v2 t1 only okay at isothermal process it will absorb some heat q1 because the processes at which the system absorbs or rejects some heat they should be a quasi static process so quasi static process temperature should be same so these two processes should be isothermal okay to change the temperature of the system from t1 to t2 see while accepting heat from the source source and system should be in thermal equilibrium it should be a quasi static process that is a reversible process okay for system should always remain at temperature t1 that is of the surroundings while absorbing heat so the process should be an isothermal expansion okay process should be an isothermal expansion while rejecting heat to the system okay while rejecting heat to the sink sink is at temperature t2 so the system should be at temperature t2 while rejecting heat to the uh, sink okay that is quasi static process they should be in thermal equilibrium at each step okay so that second process at which it rejects q2 amount of heat back to the sink that will be a Uh, isothermal compression okay so we have two processes isothermal expansion isothermal compression now in isothermal expansion while absorbing heat from the source system is at temperature t1 while rejecting heat to the sink system should be at temperature t2 so we have to reduce the temperature from t1 to t2 we have to change the temperature of the source it will accept at t1 it will reject at t2 so the temperature of the working substance has to be changed for this we choose the processes adiabatic expansion okay so if system is at p2 v2 t1 system will undergo adiabatic expansion it will be at p3 v3 t2 temperature will decrease adiabatic expansion if gas expands adiabatically temperature decreases now the system comes at temperature t2 now at this temperature t2 of the sink system will reject heat q2 to the sink by pro the process isothermal compression now after isothermal compression we have to take back the system to the initial temperature t1 okay so after isothermal compression system will be at p4 v4 because it is isothermal temperature will be t2 only now uh, to take back cyclic process we have to take back system to the t1 only so we use the next process as adiabatic compression okay so the four thermodynamic processes will be isothermal expansion so first process will be isothermal expansion second one is adiabatic expansion a third one is isothermal compression isothermal a uh, compression and the fourth one is adiabatic compression okay fourth one is adiabatic compression these are the four processes involved in a carnot engine now carnot engine is a reversible engine okay carnot engine is a completely reversible engine work done by the carnot engine will be area under the curve okay this area under the curve will be work done now for carnot engine we have a special equation that q1 by q2 is equal to t1 by t2 okay for carnot engine we have this special equation 
that q1 by q2 is equal to t1 by t2 so efficiency of carnot engine will be 1 minus q2 by q1 it will be equal to 1 minus t2 by t1 this is valid only for carnot engine this is valid only and only for carnot engine between temperature limits t1 and t2 carnot engine will have maximum efficiency than any other engine okay if we have two engines working between temp same temperature limit t1 and t2 then the reversible carnot engine will have maximum efficiency than any other engine okay this is known as carnot theorem okay so any engine working between two given temperatures t1 and t2 of the hot and cold reservoirs respectively cannot have efficiency more than that of the carnot engine okay it cannot have an efficiency more than that of the carnot engine eta of carnot engine for t1 and t2 will always be the greatest and the efficiency of carnot engine is independent of the nature of working substance it only depends on the temperature limits it is independent of the nature of working substance okay so eta reversible eta for a reversible engine is always a greater than eta for a irreversible engine for the same temperature limit this is given by carnot's theorem okay now let us move forward to refrigerator or heat pump now refrigerator or heat pump is a device which works in the opposite direction okay it is a device which works in the opposite direction what a refrigerator or heat pump will do it will absorb energy from a body at lower temperature okay refrigerator so it we have a source at temperature t1 and sink now see it will absorb energy from the colder sink okay refrigerator what refrigerator do is it absorbs energy from the food and gives back to the environment which is at higher temperature see inside the refrigerator temperature is low so it will absorb energy from the sink and give back to the surroundings which is at higher temperature so by Clausius statement we uh, any self acting machine cannot do it so work is done on the system okay work is done on the system external work is done on the system to extract some q2 amount of heat from the sink and give it back to the q1 amount of heat to the source now q2 amount of heat is extracted plus w work is done all this will be given to the source okay so t1 is greater than t2 t1 is greater than t2 so from here we will get work done is q1 minus q2 now we define coefficient of performance coefficient of a performance for a heat pump or refrigerator now coefficient of performance beta what we want we have to give we have to give w what we want we want more and more heat to be extracted from the t2 part q2 so it will be q2 by w so this will be q2 by q1 minus q2 okay this is beta so for a irreversible okay for carnot engine for carnot engine beta can also be written as t2 by t1 minus t2 okay for carnot engine beta can it also be written as t2 by t1 minus t2 otherwise beta is q2 by q1 minus q2 okay this is the coefficient of performance now let us move to Boyle's law Boyle's law states that volume of a given mass of gas is inversely proportional to its pressure p okay so it states that volume is inversely proportional to pressure or we can say that pv is a constant okay we can say that PV is a constant. This is Boyle's law. Okay. Provided temperature is constant. Okay. Provided temperature is constant. 
now let's do the charles law charles law states that at constant pressure volume is directly proportional to temperature okay at constant pressure volume is directly proportional to temperature so we will say that v by t will be a constant okay v by t will be a constant which implies v1 by t1 is equal to v2 by t2 okay v1 by t1 is equal to v2 by t2 now here t is the temperature in absolute units okay that is kelvin here we will have the equation p1 v1 is equal to p2 v2 here we will have v1 by t1 is equal to v2 by t2 next is at constant volume pressure is directly proportional to the absolute temperature so at constant uh, volume of the gas pressure is directly proportional to its absolute temperature so from here we can write that p by t will be a constant this is called gelosek's law so from gelosek's law we have p1 by t1 is equal to p2 by t2 okay now next comes the avogadro's law avogadro's law states that equal volumes of all gases under similar condition of temperature and pressure contain equal number of moles okay if we have if temperature and pressure are same if temperature and pressure are same for two gases for two gases okay we have two gases whose temperature and pressure are uh, same such that such that if v1 uh, then if v1 is equal to v2 then n1 will be equal to n2 okay so it states that equal volumes of gases under similar conditions of temperature and pressure contain equal number of uh, molecules this is avogadro's law now let us see the ideal gas equation by combining all these law we get an equation that pv is equal to nrt pv is equal to nrt this is called an ideal gas equation where n is the number of uh, moles of the uh, gas okay n is the number of uh, moles of the gas p is the pressure v is the uh, volume of the gas n is the number of uh, moles of the gas and t is the absolute temperature t is the absolute temperature now what is r r is called universal gas or constant okay what is r r is called universal gas constant okay universal gas constant and the value of r this will be equal to 8.31 joules per mole per kelvin okay 8.31 joules per mole per kelvin now if we write this equation as pv number of moles is equal to number of molecules divided by avogadro number into r by t then r by na okay this r by avogadro number is an another constant called boltzmann constant this is boltzmann's constant now value of kb is 1.38 into 10 raised to the power minus 23 joule per kelvin okay this is the value of boltzmann constant so for the equation becomes pv is equal to nkbt this is also ideal gas equation okay this is also ideal gas equation so we have two pv is equal to nrt and pv is equal to nkbt now see ideal gases or gases which obey the ideal gas equation okay at all temperatures and pressure 
is called an ideal gas or a perfect gas okay so assumptions we made while making this ideal gas okay all gases do not obey this equation at all temperatures and pressure okay there is deviation so assumptions we made while deriving this equation are that the size of gas molecule is negligibly small and there is no force of attraction among the uh, molecules okay these are the two assumptions we made while considering ideal gases okay now all gases do not obey the ideal gas equation there is a deviation okay they deviate from the at some temperature or pressure they deviate from the ideal gas equation so what we observe it that all the real gases which do exist they do not obey the ideal gas equation at all temperature and pressure okay so ideal gas equation is only obeyed at high temperatures and low pressures okay we have ideal gas equation real gases obey ideal gas equation at low pressures at low pressures and high temperatures okay at high temperatures and low pressures only so see for value of pv by t if we draw it this should be a straight line for ideal gas but for real gases at different temperature this has a dip okay similarly these dotted lines are the ideal p tv curve at different pressures but the real ones are deviating from it okay so ideal gas equation is being obeyed at low pressures and high temperatures okay see as the temperature high the ideal and the real are have the same line okay at low temperatures they have a different okay so this is deviation of from ideal gas behavior now kinetic theory of gases so the molecular when we observe the gas at molecular aspect that is called the kinetic theory of gases now in giving kinetic theory of gases we made the following assumptions we assumed or what considerations were taken into place that all gases consist of molecules and molecules are hard rigid spheres elastic spheres which are identical in all aspects for one gas and they are different for different gases okay size of a molecule is negligible as compared to the average distance between the molecules okay the molecules are very 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 far apart size of molecule is negligible as compared to the distance between them and the next part is the molecules are always in a state of continuous random motion okay they are always continuous random motion they are moving here and there with any velocity any possible velocity they can have okay during the motion molecules collide with each other and also to the walls of container okay during the motion they will collide with each other and they will also collide with the walls of container collisions are perfectly elastic okay we consider that collisions are perfectly elastic and there is no force of attraction or repulsion between the molecules okay there is no force of attraction or repulsion between the molecules therefore all internal energy is a kinetic only okay all internal energy is kinetic only next is between any two collision molecule will move in a straight line if it collides here and then collides there between these two collision it will move in a straight line next is collisions are instantaneous that is time during the which collision occurs is very very negligible as compared to the average time between two collisions okay the time of collision is negligible as compared to the average time between two collisions in spite of the molecular collisions okay density remains uniform throughout the gas okay density will not change molecules are colliding moving here and there but the density remains uniform these are the assumptions of kinetic theory of gases now how gas exerts pressure pressure is exerted by gas gas molecules constantly co collide with the walls of container when they collide with the container there is a change in the momentum of the molecule and hence an equal momentum is imparted to the wall okay there is a change in momentum of the wall it means force is exerted force per unit area will give us the pressure okay so this is how gases exert pressure due to the collisions with the uh, wall now what is the if n is 
नंबर ऑफ मॉलिक्यूल्स पर यूनिट वॉल्यूम नंबर ऑफ मॉलिक्यूल्स पर यूनिट वॉल्यूम एंड एम इज द मास ऑफ ईच मॉलिक्यूल एम इज द मास ऑफ ईच मॉलिक्यूल देन वॉट वी विल हैव वॉट वी विल हैव प्रेशर एक्सर्टेड बाय द गैस प्रेशर एक्सर्टेड बाय द गैस दिस प्रेशर एक्सर्टेड बाय द गैस दिस इज इक्वल टू वन बाय थ्री एम एन वी स्क्वायर एवरेज ओके प्रेशर एक्सर्टेड बाय द गैस इज वन बाय थ्री एम एन वी स्क्वायर एवरेज नाउ रो इज इक्वल टू मास पर यूनिट वॉल्यूम सो रो विल बी मास इंटू नंबर ऑफ मॉलिक्यूल मास ऑफ इच मॉलिक्यूल इंटू नंबर ऑफ मॉलिक्यूल डिवाइडेड वॉल्यूम नाउ नंबर ऑफ मॉलिक्यूल्स पर यूनिट वॉल्यूम दिस विल गिव एस एम एन सो फ्रॉम हेयर वी कैन राइट प्रेशर इज वन बाय थ्री रो वी स्क्वायर एवरेज ओके वन बाय थ्री रो वी स्क्वायर एवरेज दिस इज द प्रेशर एक्सर्टेड बाय द गैस ओके दिस इज द प्रेशर एक्सर्टेड बाय द गैस नाउ लेट अस सी काइनेटिक इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ दिस प्रेशर नाउ सी प्रेशर इज इक्वल टू वन बाय थ्री इफ वी राइट एम एन बाय वी इंटू वी स्क्वायर एवरेज स्मॉल एन बी एन कैन बी रिटर्न एज एन बाय वी सो फ्रॉम हेयर वी गेट पी वी इज इक्वल टू वन बाय थ्री एम v square average multiply and divided by 2 so from we get pv is equal to 2 by 3 into half m v square average okay the n is also there now see this is the average kinetic energy of the gas so from here pv is equal to 2 by 3 e. This is the kinetic. P V is equal to 2 by 3 e, where e is equal to half m. Okay, where e is equal to n into half m v square average. This is average kinetic energy of gas. Okay, this is average kinetic energy of gas. And also, if we write e prime, okay. if we write e prime as half m v square average this is average kinetic energy of each molecule okay if this is average kinetic energy of each molecule each molecule this is average kinetic energy of each molecule also e by v is called energy density so from here we can write as p is equal to 2 by 3 e by v so from here we can write that pressure is equal to 2 by 3 into e this is e is equal to e by v which is energy density okay which is energy density okay so uh, this is now for ideal gas we know that pv is equal to nrt so from here what we get is 2 by 3 e okay we get is 2 by 3 e is equal to nrt so from here we will get e is equal to 3 by 2 nrt okay e is equal to 3 by 2 nrt this is average kinetic energy of one uh, one ga uh, whole gas okay this is average ke average kinetic energy of uh, gas okay also if we want to find e prime average kinetic energy of one molecule it will be 3 by 2 or we can write it e only we can write it as 3 by 2 n k b t okay 3 by 2 n k b t because if we write r as n by n a okay oh, sorry we if we write r as uh, divide n as n by n a if we write small n as 
n by n a then r by n a will become k b so it will be 3 by 2 n k b t this is the average kinetic energy of the gas so average kinetic energy per molecule per molecule okay of one molecule uh, this e prime this will be equal to 3 by 2 r t or this will be per mole so this will be 3 by 2 k p t okay this is the average kinetic energy of each molecule each molecule is having this much kinetic energy okay now we just now saw that average kinetic energy of gas will be equal to half m v square okay so if we want to equate it okay how so e is equal to 3 by 2 n r t or 3 by 2 n k b t so from here we will get that n into half m v square average is equal to 3 by 2 n k b t so what we what will we get cancel this 2 and 2 gets cancelled n and n gets cancelled we will get v square average is equal to 3 k b t by m okay we will get that v square average is equal to 3 k b t by m now there is r m s speed which is equal to under root of v square average that is equal to under root of 3 k b t by m small m okay so this is equal to v r m s so speed of molecule okay v r m s speed of molecule is directly proportional to under root t this is kinetic interpretation of temperature that all the kinetic motion of the gas is due to the temperature okay also we can write this if we substitute kb as r into na so we will get under root of 3 rt by molar mass okay where m is the molar mass of the gas m is the molar mass of the gas this will be a vrms now let us move to dalton's law of partial pressure so dalton's law states that pressure exerted by a mixture of gas non reacting gases occupying the same volume okay it will be equal to sum of partial pressure each gas would exert when occupied by occupying the same volume at the given temperature okay so pressure of mixture is equal to sum of partial pressure of the uh, gases okay pressure of mixture will be equal to sum of partial pressure how we calculate the partial pressure if the whole volume was occupied by that gas at the same temperature okay and next is graham's law of diffusion so graham's law of diffusion states that rate of diffusion is directly proportional to velocity and inversely proportional to a square root of their densities okay so rate of diffusion is inversely proportional to the square root of density okay this is graham's law of diffusion degree of freedom so what number of independent coordinates we require to describe the state of system that is called degree of freedom if n is the number of molecules if n is the number of molecules k is the number of constraints k is the number of uh, constraints then degree of freedom is equal to 3n minus k okay so if a body is moving in three dimensions okay if we have a single atom moving in three dimensions we need x y z three independent coordinates to describe its state and motion so degree of freedom will be three if we have two atoms connected by a rod then there is a constraint okay there is a constraint that they are joined by a rod okay we need three coordinates for this three coordinates for this plus one coordinate can be known by this constraint so we need total five coordinates that is five degree of freedom okay so for a monoatomic gas for a monoatomic gas and for a diatomic gas for a monoatomic gas 
degree of freedom is 3 and for a diatomic gas degree of freedom is 5. Okay, for a monatomic gas degree of freedom is 3 and for diatomic it is uh, 5. Now, a law of equipartition of energy. Now, law of equipartition of energy states that if a system, dynamical system is in thermal equilibrium, then energy is equally distributed among all the degrees of freedom. Okay, that energy associated with each degree of freedom will be half kBT. Okay, so total energy will be equal to F into half kBT. This is for one molecule. Okay, this is for one molecule. If we have n molecules, then total energy or n moles we have. So this is energy of one molecule. If one molecule have f degrees of freedom, f is the degree of freedom, each degree of freedom has half kBT okay, per molecule. See, they have written degree of freedom per molecule is half kBT. So this is the energy associated. So total energy, energy of the gas, energy of the gas, this will be equal to f by 2 into n kB. Okay, this will be equal to F by 2 into N kBT. Now, if we write kB as R by Na, we get E is equal to F by 2 nRT. Okay, we get F by 2 nRT. Now, we know that there is no potential, so this will be the internal energy of the gas. Okay, this is the internal energy of the gas. Now, let us calculate specific heat capacity. Now, we know that what is specific heat capacity? Du is equal to NCV dt. So, from here we get CV is equal to 1 by N into Du by dt. Okay, 1 by N into Du by dt. So, let us see for a monoatomic gas. For a a monoatomic gas okay for a monoatomic gas u will be equal to how many degree of freedom it will be 3 by 2 nrt so from here du by dt will be 3 by 2 nr so specific heat at constant volume will be 3 by 2 r okay specific heat at constant volume will be 3 by 2 r 1 by n goes cancel. Now we know that Cp is equal to Cv plus R. So from here we will get it as 5 by 2R. Okay, Cp will be 5 by 2R and gamma which is the ratio of Cp by Cv this will be 5 by 3. Okay, Gamma will be 5 by 3. This is the story for a monoatomic gas. Now let us see what is for a diatomic gas. For a diatomic gas, we know that degree of freedom F is 5. So from here, U will be 5 by 2 nRT and Cv will be du by 1 by n into du by dt. This will be 5 by 2R. Cp will be 7 by 2R and Cp by Cv. Gamma will be 7 by 5. Okay, so this is the degree of freedom and this is the uh, gamma, specific heat for a diatomic gas. Now let us come to mean free path. So mean free path, so if a molecule are moving in a random motion, so average distance travel between two successive collisions is called mean free path. And mean free path is equal to 1 by under root 2 pi n d square. Okay. So where n is the number of molecules and d is the diameter. Okay. D is the diameter of each molecule and n is the number of molecules per unit volume. Okay. N is the number of molecules per unit volume volume so degree of uh, so mean free path <coughs> sorry 
mean free path will be 1 by root 2 pi n d square okay so this is all about the chapter kinetic theory of gases and thermodynamics i hope you have revised it all and this session was helpful to you so keep studying keep rocking thank you take care bye bye